to record this. All right, we've got this recording down. Okay. All right. So let's let's quickly cover the mission and the vision for our DC chapter. Uh, one of the couple of things I don't want to read it word for word, but some of the key words and key phrases that really resonate with me is about cultivating that change management excellence in this area, and as well as um, kind of have that meaningful and lasting organizational change. So that, that's kind of our mission and our vision. If you want to sit on that a little bit more, you can visit our website and read it again. So Jess, <laughs> next slide, please. Sure. All right, so I just kind of quickly spoke about our COPs. Again, we have those two COPs with the emphasis on federal space and change best practices in that area. And of course, the, the data, the data, data analytics and technology. And you can see that we say that we meet the fourth Thursday of every month. So we're, we're meeting the mark for this month, but um, we're to the wise next month, we're actually meeting a little bit earlier because our speaker then um, would be in Fiji. So we had to move it up a couple of weeks. He's celebrating his retirement, but we'll get to that. Okay, oh, yeah, next slide, please. All right, so future presentation. So here we go, we've got about 28 folks so far. Our attendance for the COPs is growing. And I think it's because of the topic. Uh, about six months ago, kind of had this aha moment that it would be really cool if we could dive into KPIs, key performance indicators a little bit more. And admittedly, it was a selfish reason because uh, as a change practitioner, it's kind of at a loss for how do you develop KPIs and what does that mean? And what are some of the best practices out there? So I threw a bone out there to the ACMP global folks on the, on the ACMP Connect and I said, hey, does anybody want to come speak about KPIs to our DC chapter? And I had three folks immediately respond. Um, and it kind of worked perfectly because we're kind of doing it uh, from different vantage points. So if you joined us last month, we had Marianne Coulter come and speak about a case study when it comes to KPIs and her experience in the health and healthcare industry. This month, I'm really excited to just, and I'll, I'll introduce her a little bit more in a second, really excited to, to have Jess to speak about KPI and frameworks that she uses to help enable change practitioners be successful in developing them. And then next month, the teaser, and it's gonna be May 12th, um, we have Paul O'Keefe coming in and he is going to speak about KPIs from a strategic lens. So what we have is this three series, this three part series around KPIs and change. So kind of coming back to Jess, Jess and I have kind of developed this great relationship um, have been communicating for several weeks, if not months now, in preparation for today. Really excited to introduce her. Um, she actually hails from Colorado, still, still morning time out in Colorado for Jess, and she owns a company called Apogee. And so um, when she does a lot of training and a lot of, and de has developed some specific frameworks um, in res with respect to KPIs. So what I'm going to do um, in service of time and in service of Jess, to not butcher her introduction, is I'm going to share her LinkedIn profile with everybody. So please connect with her. Please learn a little bit more about Jess. Um, one thing I will share is we both have new puppies, so we're living <laughs> a puppy life. And then, um, and then Jess can also share a little bit more about her. So without further ado, Jess, thank you so much for joining us today for your preparation. Um, I'm really excited to learn what you have to say about KPIs, change, and the frameworks that enable you to be successful. So here, here's her link. And if you have any questions, folks, please but let me know. But before anybody asks in the chat, we will share Jess's presentation as well as her recording on our ACMP DC portal. So there's that. Jess, take it away. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm just going to move my little speaker thing over here so I can a full view of my presentation and then have you all over here. All right. Yeah. So um, thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. Um, again, my name is Jessica Crow and I'm the founder of Apogee and Apogee is a change management training and certification company. We also offer leadership development and coaching. We actually integrate that into our training as well. So if you're taking the online version only, you still benefit from that experience. And then we provide hands-on consulting for organizations that need a little bit more support. Um, I spent most of my career, aside from the last three years, working in-house in various organizations. I've got experience in information technology, um, project management, change management, operations, strategy, communications. And I went through my own training um, in change management more than a decade ago. 
And what was really great about that experience is, well, it put me on this path to where I'm at now, but it helped to frame um, how to think about change management and really captured a lot of the stuff that I was already doing, but it put it into a container where I could use it more effectively and more strategically. So for those of you that are joining today, maybe some of you have been trained um, through other organizations. Maybe some of you have learned through the process of just experience. Um, my goal for you today is just to have one or two things that you can take out of this presentation and try and try it in, you know, your place of work with the clients that you're supporting with the changes that you are executing and recognizing that how you measure and monitor and communicate about the success of what you're doing is such an important part of your role. And as um, Stephanie had mentioned last month, Marianne, her presentation was really strong. She talked a lot about um, the hands-on experience she had with a client with the, uh, and like what they did when they measured and intervened and all of those different actions. Today is going to take a step back. We're going to talk about frameworks. This is something that came up in that presentation um, as in how do I think about this? How do I organize it? How do I create that container for what I need to be able to do to measure and report out on the effectiveness of my efforts of the change program and how it's affecting the behaviors of the stakeholders that we're targeting. Um, to front in the presentation, so Apogee's methodology, it is based on my training, my experience, and my desire to make the conversation around change management easier for people in your shoes who are explaining the value and benefits of the work that you're doing. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, not too much, talking about Apogee's approach, our methodology, and then we'll get into the frameworks. And that front end, that background will help what we talk about in terms of the frameworks, the specific measures and metrics. It'll make it um, make a lot more sense. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started since I know it is the lunch hour. And um, some of you probably have meetings starting, you know, in the next hour. Um, because we are ACMP, I'm actually part of the ACMP Colorado chapter, joined ACMP in the last year. It's been such a positive experience, part of the board. I love volunteering and being connected. I met Stephanie through this experience and she's been fantastic. Um, so please do reach out to me on LinkedIn. I would love to connect. I have just really enjoyed the process of learning from other professionals in this space. And when one of us does well, we all do well. And we really advance uh, just the conversation around the value and, and importance of change management in the workplace. Um, so the reason I put this on the slide, though, is to help frame how Apogee's methodology aligns with ACMP in case this is the standard that um, you are most familiar with and that you align with. So I'll make sure to highlight this in the presentation so you can link what you're learning to what you probably already know. So we'll get it started with how we talk about uh, change management. So we have the same vocabulary, a shared understanding of what it means. Um, we talk about change management in the context of change leadership. So we think about that in three different ways, having the right skills. So that includes having change management knowledge and understanding, skills being leadership skills as well, having the right mindset. So having a growth mindset, being adaptable and resilient, and then having the right behaviors. And what that means is taking actions that are aligned with not only your core values, but knowing uh, as a leader, as a change management professional, what you need to do to lead, influence, guide, and shape the employee experience through the change transitions. And so we refer to change, uh, change management as something that you do as a change leader. And so our methodology, we refer to it as the art and science of change leadership. So the combination of art and science is what leads to success. And what art represents, it's an acronym for aware, ready, and trained. And that is what people need in order to successfully change their behaviors. The science, which we'll get into in a second, is how you take that concept, the theory, and really turn it into action. So we'll walk through the people process and tools, and then we'll get into our definition of success, which is when people accept, adopt, and sustain the changes, whether it's a change in process, a tool, a new structure, um, maybe it's culture change. And so these are the terms that I'll be referring and coming back to. So now you've got a little bit of familiarity with that. 
Um, in terms of art, so art is our model for individual change. You may be familiar with ADCAR, that's how ProSci thinks about um, uh, leading and guiding people through change. So this framework is meant to really guide your uh, strategy and planning process. And it recognizes that all change, thank you, Heather. Um, it recognizes that all change is behavior driven. So in order for people to change their behaviors, they first need to change their minds. So it starts with building awareness and interest by explaining like what is changing, why are we changing? And then that enables people to develop the why for themselves. That's where behavior change starts when they have that personal connection. They that's when you get that buy-in, that readiness that leads to the eventual ownership of the, the adoption of the change. And then how, so that's the training, the education, how do they successfully change? How do they model the behaviors that are necessary for the change to be a success? And this is just that next layer of um, explanation around what art is. And again, I put this in here because you will have access to the slides after the presentation. And I figured that, you know, the graphics alone probably wouldn't um, jog your memory. So hopefully this helps. But again, art, or I'm sorry, aware. Do people have what they need uh, in terms of what is changing and why? Do they understand not only the business reasons for changing, but how it's going to impact them personally and what are the benefits to them and, and, and their role? What does it mean for them? That readiness piece, that's where they start to feel that level of motivation. Um, this happens through, uh, you know, through, through interaction and connection with the leaders who are guiding the change. Um, they feel supported by their managers to successfully change. And then training obviously is they have they've been trained one um, and then they have the right behavior skills knowledge to be successful this is a great tool for you as a change management professional to cross check your strategy and plans as well because if you have created a plan a strategy but it doesn't account for making people aware through communications or readiness right the focusing on the engagement you can take a look back and say oh we missed this core component of something that we need to do to prepare people to successfully change so that's art and i know i went through that quickly so if you have questions please do connect with me after the presentation let's talk about the science side now so the science is we think about it in terms of people process and tools so you've got the change leader, you being the change management professional, perhaps the change team, this could be the various work streams that you collaborate with to design and deliver the change management strategy um, and plans. And for those of you who are in consulting roles, um, often uh, you're, you know, you're building the strategy, you're creating the plans, but then the delivery happens um, you know, by another, uh, somebody else within the organization it's still part of the change team, the people who are implementing the change, they play a key role in ensuring that delivery is a success. You've got the broader project team. So for example, if you have a technology that's being rolled out, that would include the project manager, the members from the IT organization, different uh, teams within the organization that have to contribute in some way to the successful integration and implementation of the change. And the project team is a key partner for you in aligning on the success measures and metrics that you'll use. And then your sponsors, we think of them in two ways. You've got your primary sponsor. This is the person who is the accountable executive. I think we've heard about sponsorship in many different um, trainings and platforms. It's that person who's your co-partner who is going to help be the voice and face of the change. And then we think about our sustaining sponsors as change influencers. So those people that are they, they get it, they're bought in, they're excited about what's happening. They are going to help you advance the change through their peer networks, through their um, cohort, through their, you know, their, their scope of influence. And they are super important in accelerating change adoption because they provide uh, social proof and that's often what people need to start to like hey they're you know they're doing this maybe i can too our change process 
is define, design, deploy. And I'm going to get to more uh, detail around that and then how that aligns with the ACMP standard in just a moment. And then obviously all of the tools that you can use to reinforce the steps of the change process. Um, that's how we think about the science of organizational change. So the change leaders process, this aligns with the standards from 5.1 to 5.5. It starts with defining what is happening. So what is changing? Why are we changing? Who needs to change? We recommend conducting three different types of impact assessments. So on the business, what risk does the change introduce to the organization? On the organization itself, how ready is the organization for more change? So you're looking at um, attributes such as uh, culture, resilience, well-being, past history with the change, those types of factors that can prevent or um, support change readiness. And then an impact assessment at the role level, this specific system process, whatever's changing, the delta between what people are doing currently and then what they need to do in the future. That information is what you use to create your change strategy, your plans, and define what measures of success you're going to use, the specific metrics, and how you're going to, how, what, what your approach for measurement is going to be. And we're going to walk through the different types of um, measurement approaches you can use. Design is when you take that high level plan and then you build it out. So it's really the, the, the tactics, the interventions, the activities from an, there's three core plans that we refer to, um, your engagement, your stakeholder engagement, communications and training. So it's building out those deliverables, building out those assets that, and then taking action on them if that is part of your role. It includes coaching and supporting uh, leaders and managers and equipping people with the right level of information, building those relationships. Relationships are, are so important. Relationship building is so important as a change management professional, as a leader, as a business person, um, whether you work as a consultant or in the Fed space or in the industry, relationships are really how business gets done. So um, building those relationships, giving key leaders information that helps them be more effective and stewards of the change that is happening. And then the final aspect of our process is deployment. So rolling out the uh, change per plan that could be um, there's a couple of different ways you can deploy change, continuing to engage with stakeholders, coaching them through the process, monitoring and measuring performance, and then obviously celebrating wins and then intervening when people need a little bit more support. Um, what makes Apogee different from other providers is that we focus on developing resilience versus managing resistance because resistance is a completely normal reaction to change. Um, resilience is a response. It's something that requires greater intention and awareness. And we sort of start with the belief that people can change with support, with training, um, and that, you know, it's within their, within their realm. And so we really like to hone in on that resilience piece. And then finally, our definition of success. So Art, uh, the art and the science is what leads people to accept, adopt, and sustain the changes. And so sustainment is your ultimate success factor because it's the only way that the business benefits for changing can be realized. So if you think about the change process and all the work that you're doing to prepare people to change, and then you're training them on how to change, and then you implement the change, that's actually when... <laughs> you know, that's when you start to think about the business benefits being attainable. Change that isn't sustained is not valuable to companies because you can't realize the benefits for the change if people aren't consistently using what's been implemented or their behaviors, they go back to the ways of working that they had. So sustainment is kind of the keep, that's your end in mind um, for, for any of the work that you're doing as a, as a change professional. So now let's get to that next layer of, of understanding that success is when end users, when your stakeholders accept the change, so they are bought into the need for the change, they understand the needs for the change, um, uh, adoption, they're using the change successfully and sustainment, that ultimate success factor, as I said, your strategy and approach should not only outline how you're going to measure and monitor the success of the activities and interventions that you're going to implement, but what will happen once the change has been delivered and operationalized, how you're going to continue to monitor 
monitor and measure that. So what are the desired behaviors that people need to continue to, um, to, to, to demonstrate? What are those KPIs, which we will get into, that will that will reinforce the changes being sustained. And we're going to see the benefits that we are expecting when we made the investment, when we made the decision to change in the first place. So let's get into, actually, I'm gonna pause for just a second since I've been rolling through this. Does anybody have any questions before I jump into um, the, the frameworks and measurement component? Yes, I'm not seeing any in the, uh, in the chat. So I don't know cool. if anybody is coming off mute. Okay, no problem. Yeah, if you do have a question, please let me know um, and I will pause and then we'll keep going. So thinking about measurement, the easiest way to think about how you should approach the measurement process is at the individual level and then at the organization level. So change, so success at the individual level, this will indicate that your change program, your change plan is sufficiently preparing people to adopt the change, to sustain this change. Measuring change at the organization level really reflects the overall uh, change process and the outcomes. And so you're taking a look at how the individual, um, the individual success can contribute to the overall success, which is that sustainment piece so the business outcomes can be realized. And we've got two measurement frameworks, and I know this is what you all have been waiting for. Um, so, and then this is why I wanted to provide some more background on our, our methodology, because art is a, is, is a framework in itself. So art outcomes show that people are ready and they're building the necessary level of competence to perform in the new environment. And then super is a measurement framework where you all of the key performance indicators here, these contribute to not only the sustainment of the change, but they're within your scope of influence. And that's something important to keep in mind too, as a change management professional, as a change leader, what what you're measuring and what you're monitoring should be related to the activities and interventions and plans that you are executing. Because the business results, while you know that is the ultimate goal, it, it, the, the activities, you need to measure your effectiveness there because that's what contributes to it. So you're not accountable for the savings per se, but you are accountable, and if that's a you know, key business outcome, but you are accountable and responsible for the activities that will support the behaviors and the use of the system that will lead to the savings that is desired. So let's dig into these a little bit more. Art, we saw that framework earlier and what, um, what's entailed. Uh, think about art as your short-term outcomes. These are what you can measure first. Um, and this is how you, you know, are people aware of the need for the change? Are they ready to change? Have they been trained on how to change? There's a couple of different ways that you can measure art. Um, one way to do this is to ask people for their level of agreement with the statements that you saw on the slide before. It's a Likert scale. Now, I want to caveat. I know that this community is focused on um, use of technology to deliver and you know visualize uh, information, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can be super effective and impactful with some very low tech, very basic approaches to measuring and monitoring. Um, performance. And I say this from having worked in, you know, Fortune 200 organizations uh, that are that are super analytical, you can still make a lot of progress by, by with some really simple tools because your value as a change management professional is in being able to articulate how things are going in a clear and succinct way and being able to take action when things are not going the way that you want them to. The tools help, the tools support and enable your process, um, but you can really do quite a bit with just some very simple, simple strategies. So coming back to how to think about art, um, use a Likert scale and get people's uh, agreement, whether or not they feel like they were ready or, or not. Um, that's one way to, uh, to do that. So for example, and are all these data self-reported is the question. Um, yes, for aware, ready, and trained, yes. I would say with the caveat that training can be assessed and monitored um, in a different way. You can do a competency check, a knowledge check, and evaluation that can uh, dig into whether or not they are demonstrating the skills that they need to, whether they are accurate with the information. Um, so tools that you have used, yes, I can do that as well. Thanks for these questions, this is great. Um, really basic tools, SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, you can get feedback that way. You can leave smile sheets, 
paper documents where you collect information. Um, for visualization of information, now I have not used this for these types of, um, for art. I know Tableau has come up, but that's more of some of the back end. When we get to super, I'll talk about that. And I'm familiar with Qualtrics. I know that's a, a tool for uh, monitoring customer engagement. I have not used that myself, but I have done some research into it and it looks like a pretty cool tool. I know they focus a lot on NPS, um, which we can talk about as well. But I mean, frankly, you can really simple survey monkey, uh, any sort of online survey system will help you get the information you need to be able to communicate what's happening direct feedback, um, having conversations. So is that helpful, Heather? I mean, I know it's really basic, but I think I want to sort of, um, you know, make it clear, like you can use really basic tool, good. Really basic tools to have a, a, have a big impact um, regardless. So that is how you can measure uh, art, right? Aware, ready, trained. And then there's other ways to measure art as well. So now these ones, I feel like, I see this a lot in the change management space, like the number of communication sent or meetings held or people trained. Um, those are helpful. Those are helpful to your process. They definitely are metrics you can have. I don't think they're quite as strategic as art because art will give you more insight and intel into where you need to intervene. So for example, if your awareness score was low, that would indicate a need for more communications, more engagement with managers and leaders to say, hey, are you talking about the information? Are you, are you preparing your teams for what's coming next? If you have um, readiness, you come back with people feeling like they don't feel supported, they don't understand the benefits, then you can move forward with coaching, you can move forward with the sponsor, ask that individual to get involved in a way, leverage your influencers, your network of social proof to help with that story. Um, if your training scores are low, you can take a look at the format and approach. Is it delivering the information sufficiently to end users? Um, I found that sometimes low scores for for, for the experience with the change can come down to the training and the training not being um, quite as effective as it needs to be. So I like art for that reason, but these are certainly ways to approach measuring, um, measuring art as well. And I did see another question. Um, to what extent do you collect data from others' ob observations to juxtapose against self-reported? Um, my, so if I'm understanding this correctly, it's a, you're asking whether or not uh, people, if they are self-reporting the data in terms of their level of satisfaction or readiness, then you'd be doing some sort of cross check with like their leader or manager um, and seeing if there was a difference there. Is that right? Okay. Um, I think the answer is it, it really just depends on the context of the change, the type of change in the environment. So if you're getting a lot of data from the impacted stakeholder group that is most significantly impacted by the change. Their process change, their system change, they are the ones that need to be using the change effectively. And then they're, you know, the, the, the management of that, of that cohort has a different um, understanding of, of what's going on. I think that's just, you know, you can, you can dig into that data. You, can, you should always be cross-checking your data across your stakeholder groups. But I think how much you do that, it really just depends on what kind of information you're getting back. Um, and I know that's not the most direct answer, but I, I, that's how I would think about it. I would just take a look at the information that I'm getting and think, okay, if this is, if I'm getting really positive scores, but then at the time of training there, everybody's failing the training assessment, um, but yet they're having a good experience. You might want to dig into what that means. Um, I don't know if that was helpful at, at all, <laughs> JB, let me know if that was uh, useful information, but, um, maybe is there a, a Hopefully I understood the question correctly. Waiting for JB. Okay, well, hopefully that was helpful. If not, let's we can talk offline so I can better understand um, and provide a more articulate answer in that regard. Um, but thank you for asking the question regardless. Um, we'll keep moving forward. When it comes down to when to measure art, now thinking about your role and when the 
change plans are executed. So if your go live for a change, if your go live for whatever is happening is a date in the future, you obviously want to start communicating about what is going to be happening, key dates, key milestones, when people may need to be trained, what that's going to look like. You can start to measure awareness at the point of the communications plan being implemented. Readiness, on the other hand, you can measure it throughout that process as well, leading up to the training, um, even after the training, once the change has been deployed, did people feel like they were supported through that process? Are they getting what they need? Um, and that includes leaders and managers too. Leaders and managers want to hear from their supervisors. Are they feeling like they understand what's happening, that they have the tools they need to be successful, to empower their teams, to power that change? And then training obviously would wait until after people have been trained, um, you know, then you could assess whether or not the training was effective in supporting them, you know, to be, uh, to do whatever it is they need to do in the future state. So, um, sorry, coming back to, to JB's question, the question goes to collecting more objective evidence in addition to bias self-reporting. I mean, yes, I think, being able to collect objective evidence, you would do that through the competency assessments, um, you know, from from the training component. And I mean, that's that's how that's how I would approach it. You could also do it in terms of the uh, the outcome. So let's say you're implementing a new process or a system that will enable healthcare workers in a clinic to. Uh, do something differently. You could measure the the objective measurement there would be the process that they follow and um, the compliance with the process, the how much time it's taking, and even the outcomes of the patients that they are um, caring for. So that could be your objective there if you're trying to look at, you know, do people have what they need to be successful? After they've gone through that process of communications, they've been trained, you really can start to look at if they're doing those behaviors and activities using systems data, um, using, um, uh, you know, like policy and procedure, you can, you can monitor those in, a, in many different ways. And then also, you know, the, the outcomes of the overall performance of the individual, the, the patients, the clinic itself. Um, so hopefully that, that helps. Um, Coming back to, sorry, let me open up the questions. And Stephanie, is it okay that I'm sort of jumping around between the presentation and the questions, or do you want me to get oh, through? Of course, yeah. You know, I think it's like perfect timing for that, and it makes it semi interactive with folks asking questions in the, in the good, chat. Good, so, yeah, okay. Definitely. Yep. Okay. And then, are you, are your training manager and sponsors? Okay. So the question here for everyone, and for those of who are watching um, the video after the fact, the question is around, are you working on providing readiness as the training, if you're the training manager, the sponsor, kind of leading up to the training? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. And so that is when you start to build that momentum and buy it. Now, keep in mind, if, the, if, the, if there are confidential aspects of whatever it is that you're rolling out, then you obviously need to plan and prepare for that but you want to be creating that interest, that excitement for what the potential, the potential of what's going to happen once that change is implemented, because that is the vision, that is the value that's going to carry people through the challenges, the discomfort of learning something new, of having to apply more effort than, um, than not to make something happen. So, when you start to, when you let people know this is coming and that's, you know, your sponsor like, hey, we are going to be focusing on this as our strategy. This is the solution that we're going to use. You, you, you start to engage with people at that point, all the way up until they are, you know, into the training and then beyond. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but I would say that as soon as people are aware something is coming, you start that engagement process. You start building that buy-in and interest. Um, after go live to assess adoption. And then, yeah, after, yeah, so Carol, yeah, reinforcing once the change has been implemented, then you can start to take a look at more objectively, are the activities happening the way that they need to be? And that's actually, we'll get into super and that's one way to do that. But yes, I agree with your statement, which is you can take a more objective approach versus this subjective approach with art in many ways um, once the change has been implemented. 
So let's get into the super measurement framework. I love acronyms, clearly. <laughs> they're they're uh, used throughout my program. It's just a nice way to remember something quickly. So art, aware, ready, trained, super represents satisfaction, utilization, proficiency, engagement, and resilience. And so let's take um, a moment to go through each of these in more detail. So super, the key performance indicator, it measures how satisfied stakeholders are with the implementation process and outcome. So another way to think about this is, um, did do end users agree, agree with the need for change? Are they satisfied with the change process? Are they satisfied with the outcomes that they're realizing? So this is once the change has been implemented, once the change is live and people are using it. Um, you can measure satisfactions through surveys, questionnaires that direct feedback. You can use software tools to do this, um, like, like Qualtrics. And then your metrics would be um, anything from an approval rating, right? Based on the, uh, you know, the, the survey, you could say rate your level of agreement and X percentage of people approve or give it a score. It could be a percent agreement. Net promoter score, you can use software to do this, but net promoter score, it essentially takes a look at a cohort, um, the population that you're measuring, and then you're saying, okay, the people who rank uh, nine or 10 on the process, they're satisfied with the process, they're satisfied with the change in the outcomes, those are your promoter, promoters. Then you've got people who rate a seven or eight, those are, you know, those are your passives, they're just, they're, they don't contribute to the ultimate um, metric, then you have your detractors or demoters, I think they're called. So that's anybody who scores a six or below. And then you subtract people that are passives. And then you take, um, I think it's like the percent of promoters divided by the percent of detractors. And that comes up with your net promoter score. So that'll give you an indication of how you're trending like directionally, if people are satisfied with what's happening with the change, your process, the outcomes they're realizing, where I struggle with net promoter score is that when you think about the organizational change curve and when people adopt change, you've got your innovators, your early adopters, those tend to be your change influencers. The early and late majority is the bulk of employees and then you have your detractors. Net promoter score can be somewhat polarizing because you can, you're taking out that that large chunk of people who will eventually change with training and support and time and experience. And while I think it's a great metric to, you know, say, hey, we're headed in the right direction, I would be thinking about the fact that kind of where you're at in the change cycle, how long the change has been implemented, and have you given those, uh, you know, your early and late majority time to process, time to absorb, time to adopt the change. Um, so that's how to think about satisfaction. Utilization is, you know, this is your adoption metric. Um, are they using the new system, the process, the tool, the structure? Um, are they using it consistently over time? So ways that you can measure adoption and utilization, um, they're listed here on the slide. You can be taking a look at systems data. You can be taking a look at features that are being used within the system. If it's a technology tool, um, you can be, uh, you know, there's a lot of non-tech and technical ways to measure adoption. Metrics could include total users. Again, that's more of a static metric, but you could say here's how people are using it as a snapshot in time. You could measure the adoption rate. So how quickly people are adopting and then consistently using uh, whatever it is that they need to be using and percent active users. So are people coming back consistently um, and, and maintaining that behavior? So again, low tech to high tech ways, taking a look at systems data, taking a look at um, just kind of process and flow of, of what things are happening, you know, depending on the environment. And hopefully that is helpful. Any questions about satisfaction or utilization? Okay, we'll go into proficiency. So proficiency takes adoption to the next level because it measures not only are they using it, but how well are they using it? And so this gets into that objective um, observation, that objective data, I'm sorry, uh, not observation, the objective data that you're looking for. So this can be, you know, you can take a look at this through a skills test, through looking at different uses of feet, uh, feet, different feature usage. 
a good indicator that people are not using something well. So for example, you roll something out and all of a sudden the number of calls into the help desk have just skyrocketed, right? That would indicate that people don't quite know how to do what they need to be doing. Um, another way to look at this is if there's a tool that people are being asked to use and they're consistently logging in, but then they're not using the full breadth or full suite of what they're supposed to be doing. That could indicate um, that they're not as proficient as they need to be. So you can take a look at the different, you know, utilization um, of, of components of whatever it is that they need to be using. And if they're not doing something consistent, uh, Proficiently, you can dive in and say, here, here's a training on this aspect of this solution in particular. So think about utilization as your adoption, that consistent adoption, and then proficiency is how well they are doing something. You can also look at this and just in terms of overall performance. Are you seeing the performance of the individual or team or business unit or whatever it is that you're, you know, whatever component you're looking at, has it increased or has the overall performance um, declined if people are being asked to do something differently and now their performance has dropped that gives you an indication that they aren't proficient yet in whatever it is that they need to be doing. Hey Jess, you did have a question oh. and from uh, it says are there any good measures of utilization if they have no option but to use the new system? If they have no option but to use the new system. Um, I, I, so when I, when you, that question makes me think if they have no option, but to use it, I guess they would have to adopt it. <laughs> so of utilization, I think there you would actually want to focus on, um, you know, satisfaction with the, with the new system or the outcomes, the benefits that they may or may not be experiencing, because if they're forced to use it, then they, then you're going to have a high adoption, right? Like everybody hundred percent adoption, you have to use it. Um, but if they're not, if they, if it isn't, if it's better or worse than what they were doing before, that information can come out in a different way. Um, and it does Cynthia, depend on the system. Yeah, I was going to say, go Cynthia puts up the comment in there that she says it depends on the system, right? For example, if it's a financial system, how quickly are invoices being processed versus the time frame and the old system? So like an efficiency number, right? Is it time? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah. That's good. Yep, that too. And actually, that is part of um, when we get to our the measurement framework that we'll use. What Cynthia is talking about is super important for everyone to hear and know. You, your baseline data before you get started, you want to capture baseline data, and that includes with the current state. So how much time are people spending doing whatever it is that they need to be doing, right? Whether it's in a system or whether it's not in a system, it's a manual process. What is their level of satisfaction? What is um, what is the performance? I mean, you can start to, you, you measure the current state, and then you can compare that to the new tool solution, and then you create your new baseline, and then you compare, you know, down the road, how they're doing to the new baseline. So, um, and it, yeah, I totally agree. They don't do that a lot. People aren't measuring that current state and then comparing again. So that's a really important for everyone to be thinking about here. Um, really good comments coming up in the, the comment, the chat section. Yep. So um, we've got another comment here talking about how um, utilization can be, can vary even if the system is mandatory. So for example, Teams is a communication platform. You can take a look at channel chats, direct messages, responses, and then you can come up with utilization, even if everyone is forced to come on, use a given system. Really good comment. Thank you, Josh. Um, that's another way of thinking about it. We're hey, all Josh, learning from each other. Check, just a quick time check too. We've got 15 okay. minutes, so I got don't really want to get through this and thank then you. have it for an open forum for discussion and questions too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're to engagement. Um, stakeholder engagement is a leading indicator of, of sustainment for uh, the change, adoption of the change. I think this is a lot, you know, the information here is similar to what we've talked about in terms of how you can measure it percent participation and promoter score, total number of influencers. So we won't spend too much time on engagement. There's a lot of tools and software out there that you can use to leverage, um, you can leverage to evaluate employee engagement. One thing that is new that I want to sort of 
drop into your uh, your minds is this idea of measuring resilience and what the end user experience was with the process. This is a fairly new way of looking at change process outcomes and um, success. And so the focus on individual and organizational resilience, it's really in the last several years has become a key priority at the C-suite level in large part due to the pandemic, but it also it's been um, influenced by the global epidemic before the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, which was stress. And so stress, uh, there's lots of data, lots of research out there, and it continues to come out that employee well-being, stress, how uh, you know the employee experience, it contributes to or detracts from the performance of a change, the outcomes of a change and the outcomes of the organization. And so as a change management professional, as a change leader, you play a key role in shaping that employee experience. And so starting to think about developing resilience, measuring resilience when change happens, if you're not thinking about that now, start thinking about how you can integrate this into your process, um, how you can add this concept of resilience to any existing you know, evaluations, pulse checks that might be happening within your organization and ways to measure resilience. You can take a look at our employees feeling stressed. Is it, is is it, was it greater during the period of change or were they able to maintain a steady state or even you know maybe there were interventions that um, helped them reduce the level of stress while the change was occurring confidence rating trust rating these are ways of determining are people able to respond positively bounce back more quickly so then they are more ready and willing and able to change and i'm sure it's no surprise that organizations that are more resilient, they tend to adapt quicker, they are higher performing, um, their retention is better. So uh, resilience is a huge focus of mine and equipping change leaders with strategies and tools to elevate resilience while rolling out a change. Um, so would love to talk offline with anybody who's interested in learning more about how to do this as part of your process. Um, AAA measurement framework, again, more acronyms, more fun. Uh, we did talk a little bit about um, uh, acquiring baseline data. So doing this before you launch anything, before you even start your communications, you can uh, assess, um, you, you can assess what is the level of satisfaction, the utilization, performance, engagement, pre-change. So make sure to do that because this is the point from which you'll start to track and trend. This is how you're going to communicate to the people that you're working with, your project team, your sponsors, your executive steering committee. Here's where we were, now here's where we are and here's where we're going. So that baseline data is important. Being able to analyze and trend the data. This means going back and looking at the same measures metrics again in a different context over time. Um, and your different context is the value of time rather. Being able to say, okay, here's how we were performing a month ago. We've had the solution in place for uh, two months and this is where we're at. Be sure to do this both quantitatively and qualitatively. So data by itself is helpful. Being able to reinforce what you're saying with those sound bites that come directly from the end users, it's how you really create a picture that is more credible. Um, I think data, you know, as you probably all know, we can data can tell a story and we can have it tell a certain story depending on how we frame the information. So having that combination of this is what we're seeing and this is what people are saying is is way more impactful than just having people's feedback or just having the data points on their own. Um, moving quickly through this coming. Okay, so coming to the, the concept of visualization tools. Um, yes, having access, having a license, having the ability to use these, you know, online tools to pull in information to present the information is helpful. Um, I just connected with a, a former colleague of mine who works for a large global healthcare company, and they are using Tableau um, to as kind of the common, the most common for them, Tableau and Anaplan. That's for a different type of um, data, but the one thing to keep in mind, again, as a change management professional, what are you accountable for influencing? And some of these tools, with the exception of Qualtrics, require systems data. So you wanna be really clear about if you're going to be measuring a certain outcome, can you actually get that information into the into the, the tool, right? There's some of that back in integration so you can present the information so that visualization piece can, can, hap can happen. Um, I also wanna give people comfort if you're not, uh, trained in how to use these tools. It is okay. Low tech works. 
And um, you can be really effective without having those tools, but they're always going to be a benefit if you have those skills and capabilities uh, to use them. Microsoft Forms, yeah, like PowerPoint. You can do a whole lot with really low tech stuff and be very effective. Um, so just to kind of think about that as you're moving forward, if somebody's asking you like, what tools do you use? You can say, yeah, I, I use, I use PowerPoint and here's why, you know, feel confident if that's the level of tool that you have. Um, if you have the ability to use something more significant, then that's fantastic. Um, and you can make recommendations as to what that might be too. Cause really you want to, it's something that'll save you time. Um, if you're able to use something that's higher tech. Okay. Lastly. Uh, summarize and address the data. So this is a really big part of what you're responsible for. And if you forget to do this, that's okay. Start to build this into your process. Um, this is the information that you will share with your peers, your project team, the executive team. This shows, here's what we said we were focused on. These are the metrics that my team was accountable. This is where we're at. If there was a goal related with that, here's where we're at. Here's what we're doing to fix this. Um, and here's how we're going to celebrate success if we're doing well. But this is, I, I have used this template in real life in previous organizations and it's super effective it's just a way to say here's here's what's going on you want to be able to articulate what's happening and why and what you're going to do about it and that's really what people need to feel informed and feel like you've got a handle on what's happening and the value that you bring to the organization so make sure that you have some level of reporting and that you're working with your team to um come up with the right frequency for reporting out. Now, I know, so Stephanie, we've got eight minutes left. The last part of this presentation is just kind of when to measure. And we've talked a little bit about that already, um, coming up with a plan. And then, you know, the case study is, I think, uh, we kind of talked through the ways of measuring and monitoring together. But does, do we want to pause and just have more conversation since we've only got a few minutes left? I think so. I think that would be good. There's some great chat going on um, from between JB and Cynthia, kind of talking about measuring intermediately to and from results and mitigating. I think that's what I took away from quickly reading. Um, but didn't know if we, we wanted to open the forum for, for questions, if anybody wanted to voice them versus chat or both. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is any, anybody coming off mute? No pressure. I know it's lunchtime here and folks are probably in between bites as well, so. Yep, this is Carol. First of all, I wanna say thank you, Jessica. It was a great presentation and information. I was wondering if you'd be able to share examples of the questions you ask as part of art and part of super. Um, I just am curious to see kind of the surveys that I'm using and other people are using and maybe what questions you're using um, and how they compare. And if there's any standard questions you would recommend. Yeah. And I will say, you know, right now, the, the way that you would use this, take the question. So if we go back to all the way to art, um, which I don't think I can do right this second, I would just take the statements and flip them into a, like a Likert scale, a level of agreement and, and say, Hey, um, I agree that uh, I my my leadership supports me and I feel supported to change. You can literally take the definition of a where ready trained and use those as your questions for the Likert scale, for the measurement, the survey. Um, and that's a great way to, to start. So that's what I would say um, is, is use those and just turn them into a form of a question or have people rate their level of agreement. And that is what I have done in the past as well. It was aligned with um, kind of ADCAR in the past. So for art, again, simple way to think about it, but that's how I would approach it. Just use those, uh, use those statements and turn them into to questions. That's what I would do. Great. Thank Carol gave Hopefully that's comment. helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anybody else uh, coming off mute? We have five minutes left. Or we've got some great, great comments. Like uh, Dana said, great presentation and discussion. I echo that, Dana. I love this. So good. Yeah. Um, I see a question from Sunny in terms of level two assessments yeah. to test for mastery of learning objectives for training in your metrics. So when with with training, um, there's a, you know training is a different. You're looking at different things within your training. You're assessing different 
things than art and super, because you really want to create your training outline and have your competency, your knowledge check reflect what people need to know. So if you're, if you're saying level two, is it, you know, the first phase of training on a system process way of behaving, and then they come back in and they do another, you know, round of training. I, I, however you decide to train and assess people, how ready they are, it really depends on what you're asking them to do differently. Um, the complexity of that, the, the risk that's involved if they don't do it correctly in real life. And so um, I would, you know, what I'm trying to do here is give people permission to approach this in a way that is not so, uh, you've got a lot of flexibility and control in what you do and how. And all of this is meant to provide ideas on how to implement what you do because you don't have to use absolutely everything in the process and you can't really um, it depends on how quickly things need to happen the type of change the type of stakeholders that are being impacted so you have a lot of flexibility to do what makes sense for the change that you're rolling out so when you say level two assessments my answer is Maybe it depends in the past if we've gone, I mean, if we've had trainings where we've done training in phases, you're learning components of a new process and then you're getting to the tools. Um, hopefully that's helpful in answering it, but that's kind of how I, I have, I think about it. Um, thank you for all the nice comments and questions. Um, let's see. I will, Stephanie, is it possible with um, some of these questions and comments, I'd love to continue to converse with the people who are bringing these up and like learn from them and also maybe uh, make sure I understand what they're asking as well. Um, will the will the comments, the, the chat be saved as part of the overall presentation? Yes, I can save the chat as well. And then if folks, if you do wanna reach out to, um, to Jessica on LinkedIn, you can ask her questions that way as well, or um, you know, Shoot, a, shoot an email to the COP email address um, for the yeah. chapter. So, but great comments. Um, I completely agree. Thank you. And we've got two minutes left. Sunny, I saw that you came off mute. Did you, did you want to ask a clarifying question or add anything? No, no, I just I appreciate her, her point of view, Jessica. Thank you. And uh, you're welcome. Go back on mute. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for asking a question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, well, with that, we have two minutes left and I don't know if there's anybody, any other questions or thoughts, you know, very timely. Yes, yeah, great, great questions. All right, well, Jess, if you wanna hang on for a second and we can kind of close out for everybody, but folks, thank you again for joining us this uh, this April day. And I just wanna again, give a, give a heads up for May 12th, we'll have our next presenter and we'll conclude our session for KPIs. Um, and change with Paul O'Keefe, May 12th. So, but Jess, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed your presentation and I'm an thank acronym. Thank you so much for having too. me. Yeah, great, great information. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so left. much for having yeah. me. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to present and I hope everybody connects with me because I'd love to continue the conversation and learn from all of the, um, learn from everyone who is a part of the conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thanks everybody. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I should probably come down to my. Uh... Oh, somebody put Karen put these three sessions are a core reason why I joined ACMP. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Karen. Here's my contact info, by the way, in case people need it. Uh, okay, yeah. Got to get to the slide. All right. Great. I actually have to scoot, Jess. I have a one that I just realized. So no if you, problem. You don't mind I'll be around today. So give me a call if you okay. need to. Otherwise, thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Oh, we will definitely connect again, <laughs> but uh, okay. it'll be in a couple hours. So. Okay, sounds right. great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Right,